<laughs> All right. <clears throat> so to get us started, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Hansel Otero. I'm a pediatric radiologist uh, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, a secondary appointment at uh, Penn Radiology and the University of Pennsylvania. So this is a, a, a joint venture between our adult colleagues in Penn Radiology, our uh, partners uh, from the Center for Global Health at the University of Pennsylvania, and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, this is a, a, a very exciting because we've been talking about like the logistics of how to organize an event to involve our partners in Asia for well over a year now. And uh, well, is happening. We're excited to be here. We say hello and good morning to you guys from the middle of the night in Philadelphia. Uh, let me introduce you to the team. Uh, we have um, our host for the for for today is going to be Dr. Samantha Lee. She's a, a current fellow uh, with us at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, with a special interest in um, global outreach. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Farouk Dako that is going to speak right after me, um, and he's our um, my co-director. Uh, we also have the rest of the global team with Dr. Monica Miranda, Jadel Mekete, uh, Dr. Abbas Noor, Dr. Herman Derbu, and uh, Dr. Mohamed Halul and uh, Laura de Leon complete the, the team. The, the, the little squares keep changing while I keep saying the name, so it's hard to see, to, to know who I've said, who who I've mentioned and who I have I not mentioned. Our guest judge for tonight is Dr. Li Yao. She's an associate professor of radiology at the West China Hospital of uh, Sichuan University in China. And um, she, Apparently has a special interest in neural network biomarkers and prediction models uh, of schizophrenia. <laughs> she obtained her MD and uh, her um, specialization in radiology in 2017 uh, in the West China uh, School of Medicine. Um, you, she will be writing the, the cases with us. As for uh, mechanics, uh, as you can see in the agenda that is posted in the chat uh, or that will be posted in the chat, um, we're going to go um, through 20 of your of the best cases of uh, over 50 that we receive. Uh, we watch them all and then we decide who's the best and that best and second best and third best will get uh, will get a prize. Um, of course, just uh, an initial reminder that there is one special prize for the people's choice for like whatever the audience think that is the best case. So um, I pay attention so that when the polls open towards the end of the presentations, you can vote for whatever you think the most impressive case or the one that is most interesting or that you find uh, found to be the best. We, um, I think that that's all I want to say. Welcome to all the participants. Welcome to all uh, my fellow organizing committee and uh, to Dr. Jankaria, that is our um, invited speaker. And now, Farouk, take it over. Um, thanks for the intro, Hansel. We're so excited to, to have everyone here today. Um, like, like Hansel said, this is something we've been planning for a long time. Special thanks to our partners uh, and the Center for Global Health for making this happen with, with, with all their contacts um, throughout uh, Asia. <clears throat> I'm just gonna go straight into introducing our, our keynote um, speaker, <clears throat> Dr. Bavin Jankaria, who um, is a very inspiring um, individual. He's a consultant radiologist in private practice in Mumbai, India. His main interests are cardiothoracic radiology, interventional CT and rheumatology imaging. He um, did his, he got his MBBS in 1987 and his MD in radiology in 91 from Mumbai University and completed multiple fellowships. He has been the past president of the Indian Radiology and Imaging Association in 2014, the editor in chief of the Indian Journal of Radiology and Imaging from 2007 to 2013. He has also recently been the president of the Indian Musculoskeletal Oncology Society. When he's not busy um, doing great things in 
radiology. He's a he's a runner and has a passion for writing. And um, he um, his current project is the Almazvats. I probably messed that up. I'm sorry. Um, Guide to healthy aging. So um, without much um, 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 more to say, I'm going to pass on the um, the stage to our keynote speaker, Dr. Jankara. Hey, so um, thanks, Farooq, and um, the entire team uh, that's doing this uh, Penn Radiology Global Health Imaging Case Competition. I think it's an amazing initiative. And when uh, Saurabh introduced me to Farooq, I didn't really know what was going on, but I think this is something that can be replicated worldwide. And I think we can keep doing this again and again. And it pro really does help and um, give impetus to the residents um, uh, across the world to do this. Now, um, Farooq's already introduced me. And um, just to recap, I have worked in a private practice institution for the last 28 years. And so did my residency in India, went for fellowships to the US and one sabbatical in the UK. And I've continued to be in private practice and done a bunch of things in business as well. And then uh, in the interim, co-founded the Radiology Education Foundation, which is still going strong. And we do both uh, in-person and now online uh, seminars. And, you know, as he said, I've edited the journal and been the president of the Indian Association. So it's been about 28 years of practice and six years of um, uh, residency plus senior residency. So it's given me a little bit of perspective now, Farooq um, asked me to speak about my journey, but, you know, when you do that, it's all about I, 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 and me, me, me. So I just thought maybe um, I can just um, talk about what I have learned and a few things that perhaps um, may help the younger radiologists to get some perspective uh, about radiology. So the first thing is that the times keep changing and you have to learn to adapt. Um, every couple of years, there's something new. And if each time that happens, you remember Bob Dylan um, and his song where he kept saying that you need to swim, otherwise you're going to get drenched uh, to the bone and sink like a stone, right? So the times keep changing. Um, you know, some of you may have heard of chat GPT, the new AI chat tool that can write essays for you. And last month, month and a half, it's taken um, you know, the, the whole world by storm. And uh, just to make this very interesting, I asked chat GPT, what, you know, how do you uh, become redundant and what happens if you don't adapt? And these are the various things that it came up with. It took... Um, the um, chat about uh, 30 seconds um, uh, to come up with all of this. And I assume it's kind of copied from some article or whatever it is that went into creating the back knowledge uh, for the AI. But the fact remains that, you know, we learn what we learn, but if we don't adapt to new ways of working and to the changing situation and times, we do stand the uh, issue of becoming redundant. I, I've seen this over the years. People who thought ultrasound was a fad continued to do x-rays at some point became redundant. Those who thought, um, and I remember we, my, my father who's a radiologist telling me that in the late 80s, the Indian Radiology and Imaging Association had a meeting saying that the country does not need more than six MRIs because it's too fancy a tool that would never be of any major use in the country. And so a lot of people who never adapted to MR and just continued to do what they were doing got left behind at some time. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to be doing everything all the time. You need to, if you're subspecializing, so be it. I do just cardiothoracic radiology, you know, 70 to 80% of the times. But if you keep adapting to the new trends that keep coming in, in your speciality, then you continue to be relevant. 
And one part of that is that there is no shortcut. If you have decided to become a doctor, if you've decided to be a radiologist, you will need to read and learn all your life. And the day you stop doing that is the day you start withering away and fossilizing and dying. And I'm sure all of us have seen some senior radiologists and physicians who've stopped bothering. And you realize at some point that they just don't know what is going on. And they are just living on past glory, on the past knowledge that they had. And then sometimes when you're talking to them, you realize, oh, my God, you know, if, if this person is going to be dealing with patients, it's going to be a disaster. And you don't want to be that person that others say you've become. So it's just one of those things. I know a lot of our friends and family who are not doctors will keep asking us, why are you attending conferences? Why are you doing attending a lecture at you know seven or at eight and during the football match that's going to be happening or whatever? And you have to turn around and say, but that's what I choose, chose to do. And that's just what it is. And so the third corollary here is that teaching is the best form of learning. And 20 of you are presenting cases here. Now, while you're doing it because it's a competition, it's also a form of teaching. Everyone who listens to you today will take away one salient point that adds to the knowledge base in your mind. And that's how we learn as well. Every time you teach, you make the effort to relearn what it is that you are teaching somebody. And that just makes you a better doctor, a better radiologist, and you're giving back. So it becomes a win-win for everyone. Then a little bit of clinical, right? History and old exams are your best friends, right? Just, just um, embrace them. And here, I, I didn't want to share any radiology, but I thought it's worthwhile um, showing examples because that's who we are. We look at images and that's what it eventually comes down to. So this patient had come for a CT guided biopsy, had nothing, had been biopsied in Jordan, in Shanghai, gone to Bangkok where he was advised of ATS biopsy, ran away, came to India. So we started with the CT because the patient had nothing. You see these pleural, extra pleural masses also in the sagittal and the coronal scans. And, you know, all of us who do interventions have an oculobrachial reflex, right? And so I said, wow, I will do this biopsy and it will prove that we're better than the other physicians in those three countries. During the biopsy, the lesion was friable, hemorrhagic. I realized it was going to be negative. And then while writing out the case history for the pathologist, I saw something and I was just doodling around and I picked up the diaphragmatic thinning and the fact that the spleen was absent. Spoke to the patient who said, yeah, yeah, I had a gunshot injury 20 years ago. My spleen has been removed. He knew the name. He knew the word spleen. He knew that his diaphragm had been, had ruptured. And guess what? In across four countries, not one person, including me, had bothered to sit down with the patient and talk to him. And I, I spoke to the patient after that, and he said, everybody just looked at the CT scan, um, decided they wanted to do something or the other, and not one person, and that includes me, did took the effort to talk to the patient. And the answer was in the history. The patient probably didn't need a single biopsy at all, and it was just thoracic splenosis. So just, uh, you know, take on the word history. Those who don't, don't learn from history are doomed to make mistakes. This is a very recent patient. And this goes on to the other issue of old scans. 65-year-old ex-smoker referred for a CT-guided biopsy. That's the PET CT in June. Based on this, the patient had a biopsy in another country, which was negative. Everybody was worried. He comes five months later. There is no change. But more importantly, it's a calcified lesion along the inferior aspect. The lesion is not enhancing. 
So typically, you know, no change in five months, calcified, non-enhancing, no uptake on PET, you would assume that this could be left alone. But the patient has been a 20-pack year smoker, you're worried. And we just kept asking him, don't you have anything done earlier? You know, you go for health checkups. He ran a company. I'm sure he had annual checkups. And he finally said, yeah, but they've always reported it as normal. And I said, just send them. Let, let us have a look. And I said, do a new x-ray as well, which he hadn't done. So he got this done. And then he found the 2019 radiograph, which shows the same lesion here. And it's three years, no change. That's it. There's nothing to be done. And all of that other stuff, the biopsy he had through his centrilobular emphysema, um, all the trouble that they had gone through could have been avoided if somebody had just looked at these two radiographs. So prior studies are a radiologist's best friend. Now, I understand that these days we often just have to get that list through. You have to do 50, 75 reads in a day. All your focus is on identifying the abnormalities and then quickly giving a summary. And we rarely have the time to do all of this or even speak to the patient. But these are, you know, one case in 20, one in 30. If you just hit the pause button once in a while, when you get something like this, it makes a difference. And in the end, remember that, you know, we are physicians, we are, we are doctors and we are radiologists and we owe it to our patients to make that little extra effort. Lastly, take care of your health and your family and friends. And Farooq was talking about Atma Swast, which is uh, in, in uh, kind of Sanskrit says, Atma is self, Swast is health. So how to be healthy on your own? But this is a preoccupation of people who've crossed the age of 50 and then are just focused on living long, healthy. But more importantly, the cliche, healthy mind, healthy body is true at any age. And I remember that my residency, my internship, my last year of MBBS and a couple of years uh, after my residency were what I call the dark ages. Uh, and many in my generation went through that. We had no connect with our older non-medical friends. I, I've gone for dinners and I do not recall any of them. I've been to weddings, funerals. People tell me that you were there and I don't remember. So these, this is not what it should be. Um, and you all have the opportunity to lead a much better life with a work-life balance. And, and you also have support systems that allow you to do that. And you should do that. So being physically active, taking out some time for some form of um, maybe running, walking, strength training, some meditation, managing relationships with family, friends, being part of the community, all make you a better radiologist, doctor, and human being. So before I end, you know, sometimes we all wonder, you know, was this the right decision? I mean, I could have been a surgeon, I could have been an ophthalmologist or a dermatologist, and why did I become a radiologist? So um, Harry Mellon said this, you know, that the diagnostic radiologist is a clinician who has sacrificed one of those glories of practice, which is daily contact with the ill in their families. But that's because we focus on the pathology of the living seen through the medium of shadows. And then of course he goes further into all of this, but if you paraphrase it, the radiologist perceives the shadow, sees a lesion and imagines the patient. The physician sees the patient, perceives the signs and imagines the lesion. So physicians practice from outside in and radiologists from inside out. Both are clinicians, for there is no other kind of doctor worthy of the name. And sometimes we do ourselves a disservice. So when we say that the clinician said that this is uh, uh, a liver lesion that needs to be biopsied, we are then implying that they are the clinicians and we are not. And I think somewhere we have to tell ourselves, remind ourselves that we are clinicians as well. 
because what we do matters. What we do makes a difference to patient management. And sometimes it's only what we do that matters, right? And therefore, we have to be proud of the fact that we're equally clinical, doc equal, equally clinical as any other doctor could be. And therefore, I don't use the word clinicians at all. I will say physician, surgeon, or define the surgeon or the physician, but I will not use the word clinician for somebody else to imply that I'm not a clinical uh, radiologist. Uh, so I hope I've given you some food for thought. I wish you all the best, all of you participants, people who are listening, the entire, um, uh, the, all the organizers who are, who've put on all the efforts to do this meeting. And as I said, it's very impressive and I'm sure it will be replicated worldwide um, every few months. And I wish all of you the best. Also, you know, um, I am, I really, don't know who's going to win the football match and I'm conflicted, but I'm just going to enjoy the match and I hope you do that as well tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, th thank you so much, um, Dr. Jankari, for that great presentation. Um, I, I think we can all agree that we as radiologists need to um, see ourselves as physicians. And I think especially with, with, with the young folks um, coming up, it's important for them to, to, to realize that it's a privilege to be a, a, um, a radiologist and the work we do is important, but also it's important for us to take care of ourselves. So I, I know you're gonna hang out with us for a little bit. So I'm going to have um, folks uh, reach out to you um, through the Q and A and um, message you um, privately. And I'm going to hand over the the mic to Samantha to um to um take it from here. Okay, so we're gonna get started. Uh, just want to remind everyone we're gonna have an intermission after we get through the first set of presentations for about five minutes. We'll have an intermission, um, and then we'll regroup. We'll do the second set of presentations, and at the end we're gonna um, allow. You guys, as a part of the um, general audience, to vote on which presentation you thought was best. So it'll pop up as polls towards the end of this session. Um, and otherwise, uh, we'll get started. So the first um, case that we'll be seeing is by Dr. Nico Lucan de la Cruz from Southern Philippines Medical Center in Philippines. And this will be a presentation on vein of Galen malformation. So my presentation is on the endovascular management of familial type of vein of Galen malformation in a five-year-old Filipino child with seizures. I have nothing to disclose. These are my objectives, to present a case of a five-year-old female with vein of Galen malformation including its relevant history, physical examination, and, and important radiologic findings. Discuss VEGO, including its incidence, pathophysiology, and treatment options, particularly on endovascular intervention. So we have a case of PS, a five-year-old female, coming in for seizures. She was born preterm from a G2P2 mother via elective cesarean delivery due to twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. She stayed at the NICU for about three weeks and was diagnosed with coarctation of the aorta. No further work was done and was discharged to get medical advice because of financial constraints. The patient's mother is a single parent. Her partner left her during the first trimester of pregnancy and never came back. Her mother works as a janitor and is the sole breadwinner of the family. As for the history of present illness, the patient was apparently well since birth until 15 months prior to admission. The patient fell to a concrete floor hitting her head. She presented with vomiting and was rushed to the ER where a CD scan was done showing obstructed hydrocephalus. She was admitted in a local hospital and was advised surgery for ventriculostomy tube insertion. However, because of financial constraints, she refused and was discharged against medical advice. On the interim, patient had progressed with moderate weakness with difficulty in ambulation. However, no consult was again done since the mother was busy trying to earn a living. Three days prior to admission, patient had onset of generalized tonic tonic seizures. Symptoms persisted and now associated with cyanosis and respiratory distress prompting admission to our institution. A CT scan of the brain was then done, showing a dilated medium prosencephalic vein, measuring 1.5 centimeters in transverse diameter. 
the superior sagittal, straight, and bilateral transverse sinuses were also dilated. Further evaluation with MRI, again, through the dilated median vein in both axial and sagittal views. Patient was then referred to our service, interventional radiology, for conventional angiogram and possible embolization to explain to the patient and the mother the, the procedure, including the possible outcomes, the risk of complication, and most importantly, the cost. And because of the high cost of the procedure, approximately 1 million pesos or about 18,000 US dollars, the mother was very hesitant for the procedure. However, we helped her to the Malasakit Center, a one-stop shop center for financial assistance provided by agencies of the Philippine government. After three days, she was able to procure the needed expenses and consented to their procedure. So the patient was brought to the cat lab. First image shows the pre-embolization angiogram, again, showing the dilated median vein. The second image is the post-embolization angiogram. Turtle in yellow are the embolic agents used. So we use detachable coils and liquid onyx glue to embolize the prominent choroidal arteries, supplying the vein of gallant malformation, which resulted in partial occlusion with marked slowing of flow and significant reduction in the diameter of the dilated median vein. Patients had the patient had no complication post-operatively with resolution of the previously noted seizure. So what is vein of gallant malformation? It is a rare congenital vascular malformation in the pediatric population and accounts to less than 1% of all pediatric congenital anomalies. The problem here is that there is an abnormal embryonic development causing arterial shunting into the median prosencephalic vein, which is a precursor of the vein of gallant. The original connections between the chordal arteries and the MPV persist resulting in enlarging of the MPV. Arterial blood is shunted from the high-pressure chordal arteries to the low-pressure vein of gall, and the MPV fails to regress and then becomes aneurysmal. In one study, it's considered as one of the most difficult intracranial vascular lesions to manage because of difference in clinical presentation, its physiologic effects on various organ systems and their complex architecture. For the treatment and prognosis, uh, prior to endovascular intervention, the prognosis was very dismal with 100% mortality for those without treatment and 90% mortality following surgical attempts. In a meta-analysis in 2017, it showed that patients underwent endovascular embolization of VGOMs had good long-term clinical outcomes in more than 60% of cases. The take-home the take points, uh, treating VGOM is complex and challenging. But along with a multidisciplinary approach, endovascular management of VGOM can be successfully performed and can result in good clinical outcomes. These are my references. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, our next case is by Dr. Jalita Artha Porba from the Universitas Indonesia in Indonesia. And this is a presentation on galactosemia. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jelita Tapobo from University of Indonesia. Today, I would like to present about the GRAP to start MRI sequence plays an important role in a rare case of galactosemia mimicking neonatal hemochromatosis. This is our patient, a neonates with respiratory distress, jaundice, lethargy, bloated abdomen, and food feeding. This is the laboratory finding shows very high ferritin and transaminase level cholestasis for long coagulation time. Symptoms persisted despite the undergoing light therapy. And this is the urostal sonography found at ascites and hepatomegaly. It is the third child, the first child died at the age of nine days, while the second child grew normally till now. This is the MRI T2 weighted image show that very high for intense liver and pancreas compared to the kidney and spleen. This is the GRD T2 star sequence we can see that liver, pancreas, and left kidney show darkening in the second PE or 1.6 milliseconds compared to the kidney, uh, to the right kidney and spleen. This is the fifth PE. We can see that there's a progressive darkening in the liver, pancreas, and left kidney compared to, to the second PE. And we also can see that in the fifth PE, there's, uh, the spleen start to show darkening. We also can see here their ascites. So from the MRI laboratory finding and clinical manifestation, we can so very suggestive of neonatal hemochromatosis in this patient. Despite the use of agent, exchange around fusion and intravenous globulin for three times in condition didn't, didn't get better. But as we can observe the patient, we see that uh, following the breastfeeding, his condition get worse. 
but after fasting and given a free lactose formula, his condition get better. So we did another genetic test. We sent the sample to the German and we found it. He has a very full gout enzyme activity and the genetic test proved to galactosemia, classic galactosemia. So neonatal liver failure is a very severe disease with high mortality rate. It causes 60 to 19 percent caused by neonatal hemochromatosis, 20 to 30 percent caused by uh, a viral infection, less than 10 percent caused by hemophagocytic hemophagocytosis, less than 5 percent caused by mitochondrial disorder, only less than 1 percent caused by inherited metabolic disorder, and less than 1 percent caused by genetic cholestasis. So from here we can see that most of the cases caused by neonatal hemochromatosis. A high level a high serum ferritin level in, uh, is also a good indicator of neonatal hemochromatosis. MRI is the one, the quickest and least emphasis method in neuron diagnosis compared to biopsy and another examination. GRT it is the star is a medium visual MRI sequence to detect hepatic and extrahepatic hemosidorosis, while extrahepatic hemosidorosis is the characteristic feature of neonatal hemochromatosis. But the challenge is that the current MRI is very repetitive. There's another study found that GRIT2 stars shows darkening in the pancreas and, the, and in the liver from the 2.5 milliseconds to 19.4 milliseconds in seven day old girl. Another study by Alain Eze and Kau stated that the darkening on the parenchyma on the equotime 2.5 itself is great as severe 5.3 milliseconds as moderate and 16.6 milliseconds as mild degree of iron deposition. While most of the studies say that most cases of neonatal hemochromatosis show at least moderate degree of iron deposition as in the pancreas, same as our patient. So what happened in our patient? In the other hand, in galactosemia, very low gal enzyme, the gal enzyme is needed to convert the galactose one phosphate to galactose a two glucose one phosphate. So if gal enzyme is very low, galactose one phosphate can be very high and it increases the uh, phosphoglucomatase enzyme. The phosphoglucocalcase enzyme is needed to convert that glucose 6 phosphate to glucose 1 phosphate. So, if the uh, inhibition in the uh, phosphoglucomatase enzyme can cause galactose 1 phosphate very low and it can be converted to UDP glucuronate, and UDP glucuronate cannot be converted to UDP glucose. Well, UDP glucose is needed to convert it and conjugated bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin. So that's why in galactosemia, a very high level of unconjugated bilirubin cause uh, jaundice and liver failure. So the take home point is, are, although diagnosis neonatal acute liver failure is very challenging, a qualitative GRAT to star MRI can be substantially aid in reducing the range of possibility. So there's no data so far about abdominal MRI in galactosemia. Our case is by far is the first to find that Galactosemia can also has the same abdominal feature and neonatal comatosis. This is our patient now. He's very healthy. Thank you so much. This is Maria Francis. Good morning. Okay. The next presentation is by Dr. Mohammed Yasser Arafat from the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research. And this is a presentation on non-Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Greetings, everyone. Today, I will be presenting a rare case of intracranial non-Langerhans histiocytosis, which was diagnosed and treated in our institute. This was a 10-year-old boy who presented with a history of right focal seizures following which he had cognitive and motor regression. On examination, he had depigmented macular skin lesions all over his body. There was no evidence of rash, lymphadenopathy, or hepatosplenomegaly. CSF analysis done, which showed presence of nine lymphocytes, sugar of 37, and significantly elevated protein of 336. Gram stain and culture were sterile. CSF malignant cytology analysis also did not show any significant atypical cells. The rest of the uh, investigations regarding tuberculosis, cryptococcus, neurocysticercosis, HIV, Epstein Barr virus, toxoplasma were all negative. So, this was uh, initial imaging, which was done in another hospital. Uh, axial T1 sections, which revealed multiple clustered nodular enhancing lesions, which are predominantly seen along the ependymal location and in the gray matter white matter interface. So although these lesions are not typical of tuberculosis, the child was initiated with anti-tubercular therapy elsewhere. 
However, he did not respond to the medication when he presented to our hospital. So this was an MRI which was done when he presented to our hospital. Here we can see the lesions have significantly increased in size and number. These are the T2 axial sections, which can here we can appreciate the presence of multiple T2 hypointense nodular lesions, which are predominantly located in the gray matter, white matter junction, and also along the periapandemic location. On DW images, these lesions show diffusion restriction, and peripheral hemosiderin residue were noted, was noted in the susceptible to image. All of these lesions show homogeneous contrast enhancement with some of the lesions showing necrosis, and where we can also appreciate the involvement of pituitary stalk. So based upon the imaging findings, we gave a list of possibilities, which usually present with the high cellular nature, as in our case. However, the child did not reveal any other positive, pet positive primary, and the bone marrow finding was also not typical of lymphoma or leukemia. So leukemia and metastasis was ruled out and the child did not have any other findings pertaining to involvement of the lymphomatoid, lymphomatoid tissue. So the secondary possibility of lymphoma, secondary lymphoma was also ruled out. So the biopsy was done in our institute, which revealed the possibility, which revealed a final diagnosis of non langer hansen scale psychosis. Further genetic analysis revealed a BRAF V600, E600 E mutation positive which confers a worse prognosis in these patients. So this is the, the slide showing the histopathological examination. Here we can appreciate the cells are, uh, the, the tissue is predominantly hypercellular with the story form pattern of arrangement of the cells, which have abundant paley eosinophilic cytoplasm. The important thing is the all of these cells were showing diffuse positivity for CD68 and S -entren. So as expected, the child showed mild improvement on dexamethasone and cladribin. However, later he succumbed to the complications of uh, chemotherapy, and wherein he developed a severe bowel pneumonia, and he was, we were not able to resuscitate. A small discussion on these disorders. Uh, Istiocytosis is a group of disorder where there is a proliferation of macrophage and dendritic cell lineage. There are two types. The most common is the langer hansel histocytosis, whereas the lesser common variety are non langer hansel histocytosis. BRAF pathway has been recently diagnosed as an important component in, involved in the pathogenesis of these conditions, uh, suggesting a neoplastic etiology. In the previous, these disorders were thought to be uh, inflammatory or by reaction to an infection, but now it has been, there is a clear evidence that these lesions are predominantly of a neoplastic etiology. So these are the various imaging findings which are seen in other rarer types of non langer hansen histocytosis, which are uh, which have cl uh, classical imaging findings and also be differentiated based upon their clinical and immunohistochemical markers. Thank you. The next presentation is by Dr. Ema Masarong from University of Philippines in Philippines. This presentation will discuss simultaneous intussusceptions. Good morning, I am Ema Masarong from the Philippines and today I'll be sharing with you a case of simultaneous intussusceptions in an adolescent with huge Jeter syndrome. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. This is the case of a 17-year-old male diagnosed case of Fuchs-Jeckers syndrome at age six with history of multiple surgeries, including exploratory laparotomy, jejunal resection with end-to-end -end anastomosis, peritoneal lavage for gangrenous bowels secondary to jejunal intussusception diagnosed via ultrasonography at age nine, presenting with worsening severe abdominal pain and vomiting. In the emergency department, he was received with stable vital signs. Physical examination also revealed non-distended abdomen with midline surgical scar. On palpation, abdomen was found to be soft but with direct tenderness on peri-umbilical area and lower abdomen. No rebound tenderness nor guarding was observed. 
Examination of the skin shows multiple pigmented macules in the lower lip, hands, and thigh, as classically seen in Hughes Checker syndrome. Patient underwent several laboratory examinations for which the results were unremarkable and non specific. Imaging studies were also done, including abdominal radiographs and abdominal computed tomography scan. Initial abdominal radiograph is seen here revealed gas and fluid filled, non dilated bowel loops with non differential air fluid levels consistent with ileus. A soft tissue density in the right upper quadrant is pointed by the red arrow. It's also noted this finding is said to be the most common radiographic sign in the susception, aside from the more specific ones, namely the target and meniscus signs. Follow up abdominal radiographs, like the one projected before you, revealed worsening partial gut obstruction, as evidenced by visualization of gas and fluid filled dilated bowel loops, which consistently increased in caliber and number and exhibited differential air fluid levels. Persistence of soft tissue density in the right upper quadrant is observed, likely part of the aforementioned obstructive process. In this study, Pollets are now better delineated as pointed by the yellow arrow within the visualized dilated small bowel segments. In suspected cases of intussusception, plain radiography being the initial imaging study is often utilized to exclude other diagnoses, as it is neither sensitive nor diagnostic for intussusception. Here is the patient's abdominal CT scan in coronal view showing simultaneous jejunojejunal colocolic and iliocolic intussusceptions pointed by the yellow, white, and red arrows respectively as evidenced by the telescoping of the aforementioned bowel segments along with their mesenteric fat and vessels. In sagittal view, we see here multiple polypoid lesions in the visualized bowel loops as pointed by the white arrows. Still evident in this view are the aforementioned simultaneous intussusceptions. In the end, patient underwent surgery, and intraoperative findings include iliocolic intussusception involving the distal 40 centimeters of gangrenous ileum of the proximal transverse colon, the weak point of polyp, the ileocecal area. Pinpoint perforation at 190 centimeters from the ligament of trites, urulent ascites, dilated proximal bowels multiple pedunculated polyps throughout the small bowels down to the colon. Aside from bleeding and obstruction, a common complication in patients with Hughes Strecker syndrome also includes intussusception, as we've seen in this case. Intussusception occurs when a proximal segment of bowel telescopes into a more distal segment via peristalsis. Although the exact mechanism by which intussusception with or without weak points precipitates this rhythmic contractions of the bowels may be the key, especially in those with intraluminal polypoid lesions as seen in cases of Hitchstrecker syndrome. While ultrasound may be the gold standard for evaluating suspected cases in younger age group, CT and MRI, as illustrated by this case, are the more common imaging modalities in diagnosing such in the older population. These are my references. Thank you for your kind attention. Good morning. I am. The next presentation is by Dr. Nguyen Quinn Yang from the Vinmec Phu Quoc International General Hospital, who will be presenting on ectopic pancreas leading to intussusceptions. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Nguyen Quynh Zhang. Now I have Hello everybody. Um, my name is Nguyen Quynh Zhang. Now I have been working as a doctor in Vinmec International Hospital, Hanoi, Vietnam, and my mentor today is Professor Bui Van Zhang. Today I want to present a report about uh, intersubjection causing power obstruction in a tri due to ectopic pancreas. So uh, this is a four years old girl. 
uh, they have a history of recurrent in the succession. Um, uh, they admitted in the hospital with the symptom of uh, abdominal pain and vomiting. Uh, on uh, the blood test, um, they have a high level of the white blood cell and uh, increase of the CPR. Uh, this is an image of uh, abdominal ultrasound. So as we can see on the right uh, iliac fossa, we can uh, see that the image shows an intersubjection with uh, diffuse thickening of bowel. The lumen is small bowel, mesentery, and free fruit. So this is the axial plane, and this is a longitudinal plane. So we can see inside a structure. Adjacent to the uh, barrel wall here. Uh, on CT scan, um, with uh, that volume contrast, so an intersubjection um, similar to the ultrasound image. Uh, on CT scan is a co co a complicated by uh, power obstruction. Um, and uh, this uh, work of the borrower is a uh, poor enhancement. Uh, but we still can see the uh, mesentery actually here. And um, this is the venous phase. Uh, the tries is uh, go to laparostomy with a segmental intestinal resection and were diagnosed with intersubjection due to ectopic pancreatic tissue in the ileal world based on histopathological findings. Uh, after surgery, the try recovery, totally recovery with no symptom. And this is a image of the histopathological finding. Uh, we can see here is the macroscopic image. And this is microscopic image. And on the microscopic image in the solid around here, we can see the acinar pancreatic exocrine cells. And this is the dust um, arrows. There is a pancreatic duct. So take home points. Uh, ectopic pancreas is commonly found in the upper uh, vascular intestinal tract, including stomach, duodenum, and jejunum. Ectopic pancreas located in the ileum is rare. The main symptom of uh, ectopic pancreas in children, including rectal intestinal bleeding, vomiting, recurrent abdominal pain, and intersubjection. Um, the imaging methods, particularly abdominal ultrasound and computer tomography, play an important role in diagnosing uh, the complications of ectopic pancreas, such as intersubjection and bowel obsession. This is quite difficult to diagnose this or, uh, the causes due to the ectopic um, pancreas before we have the uh, result of pathology. This is my reference. Thank you. The next presentation is by Dr. Johannes Chandra Kuniawan from Palita Harapan University in Indonesia. This presentation will discuss malignancy and Paranoid's syndrome. Hello everyone, my name is Jonas Chandra Kurnion and I'm from Indonesia. Today I'll present our case report about paranoid syndrome in children with mixed germinoma and non-germinoma germ cell dioxetoma at posterior to ventricle and its management. So our objective is to share a little about the risk rare case with difficulties on diagnosis, management, and follow-up of evaluation is important. So a 10-year-old man transferred from Nova Hospital to our University Hospital Center with sudden headache radiated to both eyes in the past five days. And he had also frequent corrective hematos, 
No history of children's symptoms, no medical history before, and no risk factor from family. The physical examination showed no neurological deficit with slight bradycardia of 50 times per minute with uh, normal laboratory findings and normal chest radiograph. The history present illness was the first brain MRI taken and showed the posterior to ventricle tumor with hydrocephalus and edema of both active tracts. The treatment of acute hydrocephalus uh, treated by endoscopic ventriculostomy and the tumor biopsy showed uh, suggestive of malignancy and we are waiting for the result of immunohistochemistry. And three weeks after the immunohistochemistry showed that uh, germ cell tumor with a yolk sac tumor, mixed germ cell tumor, and the whole spine MRI was taken to seeking for metastasis, and second brain MRI was uh, follow up because the patient developed Oparinot syndrome. So the neurosurgeon suggested to germline surgery and six cycle of chemotherapy. After the three cycle of chemotherapy and germline surgery, the third brain MRI showed the tumor has become smaller. So this is the first one, first brain MRI showed that there's an enhanced tumor at posterior third ventricle, and the vision weighted image showed there's a resistant infusion of the lesion. And you can see that there is a hydrocephalus here. And this is on an FTL view, there is an enhanced tumor with central necrotic here, and the edema of obstructs and periventricular. Um, on T2 FEB, you can see that there is a heterogeneous enhanced tumor at and posterior third ventricle. Interoperative tumors showed that this is the tumor of very big hair uh, causing a hydrocephalus and ventriculostomy to reduce the uh, hydrocephalus. So the cerebral uh, fluid can go out from the third ventricle. And the cell cell fluid showed normal HCG and normal AHP. So at the time, we are confused why, why this is normal. So the immunohistochemical staining showed that the AHP expressed by the tumor and so far positive confirmed that this germinoma and yolk tumor. And this was the pathological anatomy at the frozen section of the DRFC. Uh, the second brain MRI after he developed a uh, Perenot syndrome, uh, this progressively enlarged tumor and the involvement of the testal pet, you can see that, and uh, the radius edema of the detect and detect of hydrocephalus. So this is uh, the after the first chemotherapy, the brain MRI of the tumor already becomes smaller. So the discussion of how to differentiate the type of the tumor by the location of the tumor. So in pediatric, usually there's a the ependinoma is the most frequent tumor. However, the location you can see here that the posterior to ventricle is used to the teratoma of germinoma. So this is Parnell syndrome. There are syndrome of many uh, symptoms. And on our case, that the patient also developed a deep location. So there's a, there are many types of pineal region tumor, can be GCT, pineal parenchymal tumor, and this is not the uncommon one. But the, to differentiate it by the pathological and is was the best one with no histocrine history. So this is our case, uh, the germinoma and mixed with uh, sectomor. So how to distinguish between germinoma and GCT? Uh, we have to look at the MRI. Germinoma is usually a homogeneous or heterogeneous enhancement and a no low of ADCP. However, in the tumor, usually there is a heterogeneous enhancement with hemorrhoids of center necrotic and so a high ADCP. In if there is a both mix or GCT, it's a bit difficult on differentiated by both of them on MRI. So the left part laboratory failure is important to differentiate like pure germinoma, yoxet tumor, for a for any of and make GCT because the FB and beta HCE, you can see that there's different uh, all the time. So conclusion, definitive diagnosis of interventional trauma depends on the pathologic examination, intravenous contrast on brain MRI combined with AP and beta HCE blood test is important. And pineal region mass are often in fact the adjacent structure, so it's not always in the pineal region, and this case as a posterior of third ventricle. So this is uh, my reference. Thank you very much for your attention. The next case is by Dr. Justin Daniel Belmont from Philippine Heart Center. We'll be presenting on endometrial cyst. Erlin Werner Wunderlich syndrome is a rare congenital genitourinary tract anomaly characterized by a triad of one congenital uterine fusion anomaly, two obstructed hemitract, and three apsilateral renal genesis. Patients usually present in adolescents with symptoms relating to amenorrhea or painful menstruation. 
initial sonographic evaluation usually reveals an abnormal internal pelvic anatomy and MRI is needed to confirm the diagnosis. Mabuhay, I am Dr. Justin Belmonte. My mentor is Dr. Irene Bandong from the Philippine Heart Center here to present a case of Herlin Werner Wonderlich syndrome. This is a case of Katie, a 16-year-old Filipino female who was a daughter of a chemist and food technologist. She had been experiencing monthly cyclical pelvic pain corresponding with the regular menstruations since she was 12 years old. Because the pain would spontaneously resolve and menstruation was regular, no formal consultation was done. Presumably, as symptoms were attributed to dysmenorrhea. Later on, with persistent pain and with an associated gradually enlarging lower abdominal mass, consult was sought. Her initial gynecologic sonogram showed two distinct uterine horns separated by deep cleft, with low-level echoes in the endometrial cavities, particularly in the left, which was also slightly enlarged. Additionally, subjacent to the left horn in the left adnexa, a large heterogeneous predominantly hypoechoic cyst was seen. Due to the peculiar gynecologic features, MRI was requested for better delineation. MRI indeed confirmed the presence of two uterine horns. Shown here is a T2-weighted image of the pelvis in an oblique parasagical plane. The right horn, or right hemiuterus, assumes a continuous tract with the single cervix and vagina. <laughs> Next, here on an oblique coronal section, now in a T1 weighted sequence, on the lower portion of the image, as pointed by the arrow, is the left horn or left hemiuterus. Hyperintense fluid is seen within, and this fluid was isointense on T2. Notably, this left hemiuterus had no appreciable communication with the cervix and vagina, unlike the right side. Additionally, in this plane, as indicated by the arrowhead on top, is the large cyst previously seen on ultrasound. It demonstrated multiple loculations, and it had similar signal characteristics as the endometrial fluid in the left hemiuterus, both of which were consistent with blood, meaning there is left hematometra, and blood products comprise the contents of the left adnexal cyst. Finally, an additional crucial finding seen is the absence of the ipsilateral left kidney. On this coronal section, the left kidney is not visualized and the renal fossa is instead overlaid by bowel lips, as indicated by the arrow. The given triad of one, left renal genesis, two, a bicornuate uterus, and three, an obstructed left hemiuterus with hematometra, qualifies the patient under the spectrum of herlin werner wonderlich syndrome. Patient KT underwent left hemisterectomy and salpingo-ophorectomy, thereby removing the left hemiuterus with hematometra and the left tube ovarian complex housing the large adnexal cyst. The cyst, later on, histopathologically confirmed to be an endometriotic cyst. The triad of anomalies classified under herlin werner wonderlich syndrome are as follows. A congenital uterine fusion defect such as uterine didelphis or bicornuate uterus is the first component. There is a lack of communication of the left hemiuterus with its usual egress to the cervix and vagina. Unfortunately, the normal uterine lining remains physiologically active, and with time, the continued menstruation leads to enlargement of the left hemiuterus, which resulted in the patient's symptoms. Products of menstruation even escape into the adnexa, and endometrial cells are implanted into the left ovary. The endometriotic cyst, therefore, is a direct consequence of the chronicity of her condition. The pathophysiology of the syndrome involves the interstimulation of the mesonephric and Mullerian ducts during fetal development. Although the exact mechanisms are still not fully understood, there is a strong association with ipsilateral renal genesis. Despite all this, patients still have excellent prognosis in terms of symptomatic improvement and future fertility postoperatively. Thus, early diagnosis is key to preventing long-term endometriotic complications. The take-home point being that ultrasound as an initial low-cost diagnostic modality can suggest the possibility of such congenital diseases and with high index of suspicion, MRI can be used to confirm the diagnosis and allow preoperative planning. With that, I end my presentation. These are my references. Thank you so much for listening. Early. The next presentation is by Dr. Um, Tron Duck Tuan from Vinmec International Hospital, who will be presenting on Meg's syndrome. 
Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Tom from the Impact Hospital in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And today I would like to present you a case report of May syndrome, which is quite rare. Uh, a 68 year old woman presented to the emergency room with complaints of fatigue, dyspnea, dry cough, and increased abdominal circumference for a few months. Uh, the patient had no waist loss or fever. On ascultation, there were obscene breast cells and dyes to be noted over the lower half of the left side of the thorax, which is suspected for hydrothorax. On abdominal examination, there was a large pupil pelvis mark noted over the level of the umbilicus. The patient was then indicated for the chest X ray and abdominal ultrasound. On chest X ray, the patient uh, has a uh, little pleural effusion with heterogeneous. Uh, opacity in lung fields, mainly in the right side. And uh, on abdominal uh, ultrasound, there were present a pelvis mark, which the uh, radiologist initially suggested a massive uterine fibroid. The patient was then indicated for a CT scan with a uh, contract agent for the chest and abdomen. Uh, we find that there was a present of a uh, an uh, abdominal pelvis heterogeneous mark with clear borders, fed by the arterial branches originating from the left internal iliac artery, which therefore subsists for the origin from a left ovarian. There was no evidence of lymphadenopathy. There were also present of ascites and period level pleural effusion. We decided to do the corneal biopsy for this patient to diagnose the pelvis man, and the pathologist concluded that is a benign ovarian fibroma. And from here, we started to think about the diagnosis of a uh, base syndrome. Uh, the treatment for this patient was surgery, and after the removal of the mass, the ascites and pleural effusion resolved spontaneously and does not recur. The final pathology report confirmed the diagnosis of benign fibroma. Um, so now I will present a little bit about uh, May syndrome. May syndrome is defined as a triad of benign ovarian tumor with presence of ascites and pleural effusion, which will resolve after resection of the tumor. The ovarian tumor in May syndrome is a fibroma, but in pseudomay, the ovarian tumor is a non fibroma in a tumor. More presentation of can in postmenopausal women with peak incident at a seven decade of life. It is extremely rare in women less than 30 years old. The prognosis for the patient with the May syndrome is very good. With life expectancy after surgical removal of the tumor is the same as in the general population. That's the patient may have symptoms of fatigue, chronic of breath, and increased abdominal circumference. Sometimes the patient may have a weight loss and a cough. The patient also may have a family history of ovarian cancer. On examination, uh, the patient may be a tachycardia, tachycardia, and uh, when uh, we check the lungs, there will be damage to percussion and uh, decreased breast sound due to pleural uh, effusion. On abdomen uh, examination, we can find present of a pelvis mark with present of a scientist. About the lab test, the CA125 uh, can be elevated in my syndrome, but the degree of elevation does not correlate with malignancy. Uh, uh, imaging. A chest radiography can confirm the presence of pleural effusion, abdomen, and uh, pelvis ultrasound can confirm the presence of uh, ovarian mass with ascites, and CT scan can confirm ascites and uh, ovarian mass, and there is no sign of distant metastasis. Uh, the patient can be uh, indicated for procedure to remove the fluid in the thorax and the abdomen to uh, feel more comfortable. The treatment uh, for the patient with May syndrome is the surgery to resect the uh, pelvis tumor. And after the resection of the pelvis tumor, the ascites and pleural effusion will resolve spontaneously. So, some take home messages. Uh, why the clinical picture of ovarian mass with concomitant uh, ascites and pleural effusion is concerning for malignancy? Uh, clinicians need to be reminded of non syndrome and the possible diagnosis with in our etiology. Uh, the ascites and pleural effusion will resolve and the CA125 normalizes after removal of the mass. In May syndrome, the ovarian uh, mass is a benign fibroma. Uh, and in pseudomay, the uh, ovarian mass is a non fibroma, fibroma in the night tumor. Thank you. That's all. Bye bye.
Hi everyone. Okay, thank you everyone for tuning in so far. We're gonna take a short five minute intermission. Um, we look forward to seeing you back here afterwards. We will be uh, presenting one case that had initially been planned for the first session and we will be doing that in the second session. Uh, don't forget to keep paying close attention so that you can vote for your People's Choice Award at the end of the event uh, through the poll that we'll be demonstrating on the screen. Enjoy your break and we'll see you in about five minutes. Okay, we're back after that short break. And I think, um, let me see what I click here. <laughs> and <laughs> Samantha is gonna take over again. So. Okay, so uh, welcome back everyone. Our next presentation is by Dr. Christian Albert Velasco from Philippines. We'll be presenting on uterine malformations. Good day. I am Dr. Christian Albert Velasco, together with my mentors, Dr. Apollonio Bernardo and Dr. Jesse Dizor Cortez from Southern Philippines Medical Center, presenting to you an interesting case entitled Almost Impossible to Find, a case of uterine diagnosis, transverse vaginal septum, and persistent cloaca in a 16-year-old female. Patient JM, 16-year-old female, came due to abdominal pain and side leg hematuria. The patient and was born with a single perineal orifice and an imperforate anus. Thus, colostomy was done. Eight years prior to admission, posterior sagittal anorectoplasty was performed, and the following year, poultry procedure was done with colostomy closure. Five years prior, cystoscopy and vesicoureterography revealed persistent cloaca, hence, ureteroplasty was done. Two years after, abdominal distension and diffuse intermittent abdominal pain with cyclic hematuria ensued. Thus, cystoscopy was done. Two months prior, recurrence of symptoms prompted the patient to seek consult, hence was admitted. On admission, physical exam showed ambiguous genitalia, hyporomegaly, fused labia, non-visualized urethral meatus, and a descended urinary bladder with non-patent cystoscopy tube. Abdominal pelvic CT scan showed complete duplication of the uterine horn as well as the cervix with no communication between them. The uterine horns are widely divergent. A vertical vaginal septum is seen. Both hemivaginas appear descended with hypodense clear collections and separated by the septum with a distal communication. Minimal hypodense clear collections are also seen in the bilateral endometrial cavity. This was signed out as uterine didelsis with vaginal duplication, bilateral hydrometrocolpus, and right hydrosalpine, secondary to transverse vaginal septum and persistent urogenital sinus. Pelvic MRI coronal T2 weighted image of the uterus showed two widely divergent uterine horns separated by a deep fundal cleft. Minimal amount of hyperintensive collection is seen within the cavity of each uterine horn. Two separate proximal vagina is seen connected to the cervix. Each hemivagina is physically dilated, exhibiting fluid fluid level. A common channel bifurcating anteriorly into the urinary bladder and posteriorly into the vagina is seen. This was signed out as uterine diadelsis with vaginal duplication, bilateral hydrometropulpos, and right hydrosalting, second diatrous and first vaginal septum, and persistent urogenital sinus. A multidisciplinary team of doctors involving pediatric surgery, urology, gynecology, and reconstructive surgery performed successful corrective procedures with no complications. Uterine diadelsis occurs in 1 per 30,000 cases and 0.5% of the population. It is defined as two separate uteri, each with its own cervix. An even rarer type is when there are two vaginas. MRI is a gold standard in diagnosis. 
two treatment is needed for asymptomatic patients. However, for symptomatic cases, attachment of the two uteri is warranted. On the other hand, persistent cloaca occurs in 1 per 50,000 cases caused by abnormal partitioning of the cloaca, distal vagina, urinary tract, and rectum, all leading to a single common channel in the perineum. MRI is the imaging of choice. Treatment would include urethroplasty and posterior sagittal inorectoplasty. These are two extremely rare anomalies occurring in one patient. This is the first reported case of persistent cloaca and uterine diagnosis in an adolescent with thorough workup, thus making it more unique. With today's modern imaging, diagnostics have been refurbished to help patients regain their hope and with much faith, prove with conviction that indeed, nothing is ever impossible to find. Thank you. Good day. Okay, our next case is by Dr. Pat Vincent Eng from Davao Doctors Hospital in the Philippines, who will be presenting on hemoptysis during menstrual cycle. Good evening, I'm Dr. Pat Vincent Ang, a radio resident at Davao Doctors Hospital in the Philippines, Mabuhay. I'm here to present a case entitled, a Consistently Inconvenient Visitor. I have no disclosures. This is a case of a 31-year-old Filipino female, gravity 1, para 0, with significant history of dilatation curatage, 7 years prior to onset of symptoms, and non-contributory social history. Her condition began two years ago with episodes of hemoptysis on the first day of her menses. Physical examination was unremarkable. Chest radiograph was negative. Tranexamic acid given, hemoptysis resolved within 24 hours. There was recurrence of hemoptysis in the next menstrual cycle, followed by a cycle without hemoptysis. Temporal relationship of hemoptysis and menstruation was not established at this time. Hemoptysis recurred during the first day of the subsequent 11 menstrual cycles, which spontaneously resolved within 24 hours without medications. She was symptom-free during the intermenstrual period. Physical examination, chest radiograph, blood test, and sputum assay were unremarkable. Chest CT scan performed on day one of the menstrual period revealed a pulmonary cyst in the posterior basal segment of the right lower lobe, with ground glass opacities in the adjacent parenchyma and focal ground glass opacities in the superior segment of the left lower lobe. Follow-up CT during the intermenstrual period showed complete clearing of the bibasal ground glass opacities. The right lower lobe pulmonary cyst showed minimal increase in size, and a new pulmonary cyst was seen in the superior segment of the left lower lobe. TVS and pelvic MRI were negative for pelvic endometriosis. Hemoptysis is potentially life-threatening with many possible etiologies. Common causes include the following. Patients presenting with recurrent hemoptysis simultaneous with the menstrual period strongly indicate tataminal hemoptysis. The negative laboratory workup, normal chest radiograph, and cyclical changes on chest CT exclude other causes of recurrent hemoptysis. Repeated hemoptysis during menstruation followed by a symptomless intervening period is diagnostic for tataminal hemoptysis. Thoracic endometriosis syndrome refers to clinical and radiological manifestations associated with the deposition of endometrial tissue in the lung parenchyma, pleura, diaphragm, and or trachea bronchial tree. It has four clinical entities divided into the pleural and pulmonary forms. In the study by Joseph et al., cataminal pneumothorax was the most common presentation followed by hemothorax, hemoptysis, and lung nodules. Cataminal hemoptysis refers to recurrent hemoptysis concurrent with the menstrual period. Only 75 cases have been reported in literature. To date, there has been no published reports of TES from the Philippines. Several theories explain the etiology of TES, but the microembolization theory is the most probable explanation for its pulmonary form. The pulmonary network filter that traps endometrial particles results to pulmonary endometrial implants. Capillary rupture during menstruation leads to hemoptysis. Histopathological evidence supports this theory. In two published papers, prior uterine procedures like dilatation and curatage are risk factors for cataminal hemoptysis and is seen in the patient's prior medical history. Although definitive diagnosis requires histopathological confirmation, histologic confirmation has been obtained in less than one third of reported cases. Bronchoscopy has limited role as most pulmonary endometriosis involves distal parenchyma. Presently, there is still no standard of treatment for cataminal hemoptysis. Treatment options include conservative management, hormonal therapy, and surgery. Hormonal therapy alone has high recurrence rate regardless of the medication used. Nine-month treatment of oral plus ethinyl estradiol was initiated. 
three months post treatment, no hemoptysis recurred. Repeat CT on day one of the menstrual period showed new ground glass opacity in the superior segment of the right lower lobe. The same pulmonary cyst in the posterior segment of the right lower lobe now shows minimal surrounding ground glass opacities. Pulmonary cyst in the superior segment of the left lower lobe is again identified with no recurrence of ground glass opacities. Interval CT scan of the, in the intermenstrual period showed complete clearing of the ground glass opacities in the posterior basal segment of the right lower lobe. The rest of the findings are unchanged. In conclusion, this rare case of thoracic endometriosis syndrome presenting as catamial hemoptysis was successfully treated using combined oral contraceptive pills. With treatment, no recurrence of hemoptysis was observed despite recurrence of radiologic findings. It is unknown whether there will be radiographic resolution with time. The following are my take home points. Repeated hemoptysis during menstruation followed by a symptomless intervening period is diagnostic for catamial hemoptysis. Cyclical changes on CT imaging is diagnostic. Histologic confirmation is obtained in less than one third of reported cases. Observation, hormonal therapy, and surgery are the treatment options. As radiologists, we play a vital role in the diagnosis of catamial hemoptysis and can recommend the proper timing of imaging procedures. These are my references. Thank you and good evening. The next case is by Dr. Win Tan Yam from. Vietnam will be presenting on ectopic choroid plexus papilloma. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Nguyen Thanh Nam, a radiologist from radiology department of Vinmet International Hospital, Vietnam. Today, I am honored to present a case report of ectopic choroid plexus papilloma in the cerebellar pontine angio. A 41 years old male complained on occipital head edge and occasional visual decreasing for a few weeks duration. He's having drinking with alcohol intake about 20 drinks per week. He's non smoking. On physical examination, uh, we view occipital pain when compressed, and laboratory findings show. A slight uh, hyperlipidemia and slight increase in uh, ALT and GGT. <clears throat> On MRI findings, uh, show a well defined mass lesion size of uh, 35 32 to 29 millimeter in the left uh, cerebellar pontine angle. The mass compressed and it displayed the medulla oblongata and the fourth ventricle to the right. Displace the left vestibular nerve anterior superiorly and the left cerebellar hemisphere superiorly. The lesions show hypo signal intensity on T1 rated images and show heterogeneous hyper signal intensity on T2, clear, swan, and three quip images. <clears throat> the mass cause moderate edema of the left superior cerebellar uh, parenchyma. On post contrast enhanced uh, images, these lesions show significant heterogeneous enhancement. The patient underwent a circle biopsy at Cherry Hospital, where the lesion was partially resected. On histology, uh, histology results show a tumor with, uh, which uh, composed of Papillary line by cuboidal to columnar epithelium with clear nuclei. The histoimmunochemistry test show the shell, uh, show the immunoreactivity for CK7, oleofibrillary acidic protein, and immunonegativity for thyroid transcription factor one. It's confirmed a likeness of uh, atypical choroid uh, plexus papilloma. For plexus papilloma, I mean, I two months, who read uh, one uh, that arise from the epithelial cells from polyp plexus. It occur in all group of age. Insurance is located in supra uh, tensorial compartment where the lateral ventricle is the most common site. 
Il erlaubt der Vorventrikel uh, ist der Prefer Site. The extra ventricular primary colloid plexus papilloma are extremely rare. Where the cerebellar pontine angio is one of the unusual size of uh, colloid plexus papilloma, which might occur due to direct tumor extension through the four ventricle or polymer lechica. On MRI imaging, it show hypointensity on T1 weighted images heterogeneous and hypoetinal intensity on T2 weighted squan flare and 3D equipped image with significant enhancement without restricted diffusion. Diagnosed uh, confirmed by histology and histoimmunochemistry tests as uh, atopic choroid plexus papilloma with differential diagnosis is uh, granular eight nerve schwannoma metastasis or meningiomas. Autosurgical excision of choroid plexus papilloma in the treatment of choice. Thank you for attention. The next case is by Dr. Mark Collado from Southern Philippines Medical Center, who will be presenting on Wolf-Hirshhorn syndrome. Hello and good day, everyone. I am Mark Collado, representing the Department of Radiological and Imaging Sciences of Southern Philippines Medical Center. With me are my mentors, Drs. Ronald J. De Castro, Maria Teresa Sanchez, and Sylvester Rio Avellana. I present a case of a now two-year-old male infant born full-term via cesarean section and negative for infectious prenatal testing. He was seen with multiple congenital anomalies at birth and developed epilepsy, neurodevelopmental delay, and was stunted and small by one year of age. The patient at 14 months had a wide forehead, a large glabella, a small philtrum, and micronatia, akin to a Greek warrior helmet. Ectrodactyl, also known as a lobster claw deformity, is present in both hands and in the left foot. Examination of his genital area show a defect at his prepuce, hypospages, and an absent left testicle. Genetic testing using sequence analysis and deletion duplication testing identifies copy number losses in genes located in chromosome 4. Radiograph of the left hand show a claw hand deformity with absence of the second and third digits with variable degrees of hypoplasia in the first and second metacarpals. Ultrasound of the scrotum show the right testis in C2 with an empty left scrotal sac. The left testis was appreciated in the left inguinal region. E2 flare image of an MRI done at 1.5 Tesla shows squaring of the lateral ventricular horns and apparent loss of white matter volume. These findings are suggestive of wolf hirschhorn syndrome a multiple congenital anomaly syndrome resulting from chromosome deletion at the short arm of chromosome 4 that occurs as a random event during the formation of reproductive cells or in early embryologic development. This WHS is a rare multiple congenital anomaly syndrome from deletions in short arm of chromosome 4. Clinical genetic cis consult, genetic testing, and counseling are necessary for optimal patient care. Imaging is non-specific for the syndrome. However, serial imaging is necessary for close follow-up of complications. The prognosis depends on the size of the lesions and the patient phenotype. They, the patient is currently on anti-epileptic medications and on close follow-up with an interdisciplinary approach. Thank you, and these are my references. The next case is by Dr. Nona Shrasta from Siraj Hospital, who will be presenting on eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nona Shrasta, second year radiology resident, currently doing my residency at Faculty of Medicine, Siraj Hospital, Mahidol University, Thailand. Today, my topic of presentation is eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis with cardiac involvement, a unique case report. So starting with the history, a 24-year-old female, 
presented with acute dyspnea and chest pain for three weeks. Her underlying conditions were asthma and nasal polyps. On physical examination, she was alert, oriented with no apparent distress. Only displaced point of maximal impulse was found. Her vitals were stable as shown here. For her lab findings, her CBC showed eosinophilia of 18.3%. Her anchor was positive. It was said sedimentation rate was normal. C-reactive protein was raised. Bronchoalveolar lavage was done with short mark inflammation with numerous eosinophils. For other investigations, chest X-ray was done, which shows diffuse multifocal patchy airspace opacities in the right lung. CT chest showed multifocal peripheral consolidation, ground glass opacities in bilateral lungs, and reverse hollow sign in the lower lobes. Transesophageal echocardiogram was also done, which showed severe global hypokinesia of left ventricle, reduced left ventricular ejection fraction of 25%, moderate pericardial effusion. Cardiac MRI was done, which showed mildly enlarged left ventricle, pericardial effusion, and sub intercardial late gadolinium enhancement. The initial impression works had failure reduced ejection fraction, pericardial effusion, and multifocal pneumonia after just X ray and CT chest have been reviewed. So starting with the imaging finding, this is the first figure of the paint frame of chest showing the multifocal diffuse patchy airspace opacities on the right tongue is shown by the arrow in this image. Moving on to the next image, this is a figure of um, CT chest showing the multifocal consolidation, peripheral consolidation, which is more on the right side than the lung of the lung. And we can also see the ground glass opacities in both the lower lobes of the lungs, and we can see the reverse hollow sign, which is a ground glass opacity surrounded by the consolidative areas. So this is a cardiac MRI axial shot axis, which shows the late gadolinium enhancement. We, here we can see the sub endocardial enhancement of the basal to mid inferior septum, inferior and inferior lateral walls, shown by the figures, um, sorry, shown by the arrows. And we can also see the sub endocardial enhancement in the anterior, mid anterior wall, and the papillary muscle, as shown by the arrowhead in figure C. So this is another figure, which is a four chamber view, which shows the sub endocardial enhancement, patchy enhancement of the basal to apical segment of the lateral walls. And this is another figure, which shows a three chamber view, shows patchy sub endocardial enhancement of the basal to mid inferior lateral wall, walls as shown by the arrow. Sub endocardial enhancement pattern can be seen in ischemic heart disease, myelitosis, and eosinophilic myocarditis. However, in our patient, the patient is young, therefore, Ischemic heart disease is unlikely. Her underlying asthma and nasal polyp raises a suspicion for isophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis with cardiac involvement. So for her hospital course and treatment, given all presentation lab to work up in imaging studies, this is likely a rare case of AGPA, a systemic disease with multi-organ involvement, especially uh, cardiac involvement in our case. She had blood and tissue synophilia, positive anchor, high CA reactive protein, organizing pneumonia on CT, along with myocarditis on cardiac MRI. The patient was admitted to the hospital. Her acute symptoms of heart failure was treated until it was under control. To treat her asthma and synophilia, benralizumab was prescribed. She responded to the treatment well, and all her symptoms were gradually improved, and she was discharged from the hospital. So for the take-home message, we, um, um, we have... Uh, AGP is known as, for, was formerly known as Chuck Strauss syndrome. It's a rare multisystemic immune mediated inflammatory disease with an incidence of 0 0.5 to 4.2 cases per million. There's three phases, which is a prodromal asymphilic and vasculitic phase. And the diagnostic criteria, according to American College of Rheumatology 1990, is, includes asthma, asymphilia, more than 10%, neuropathy, non-fixed pulmonary infiltrates, paranasal sinus abnormality, extravascular asymphilia. Out of six criteria, four were met and is diagnosed as EGPE. Treatment was done with clopidogrel, immunosuppressants, and monoclonal antibody. Thank you. These are my reviews. The next presentation is by Dr. Ralph Behar from the University of Philippines in the Philippines, who will be presenting on extramedullary plasma, plasma cytoma. Our patient is a 67-year-old female household helper for 30 years with a two-year history of left-sided progressively worsening nasal obstruction with associated hyperosmia, hyponasal speech, epiphora, and an episode of heavy unilateral epistaxis, which prompted consult at our institution. 
Physical examination findings reveal the palpable tender mass bulging onto the left nasal sidewall and part of the left nasal ala with associated broadening and contralateral deviation of the nasal dorsum. Initial contrast-enhanced CT scan of the paranasal sinuses showed a lobulated mildly enhancing soft tissue mass measuring 4 by 1.6 by 3 cm centered in the left nasal vestibule. Medially, the mass causes a mild rightward deviation and thinning of the nasal septum with extension to the left nasal lacrimal duct as seen by the arrowhead on axial view. On bone window, the said mass shows associated thinning of the adjacent nasal bone anteriorly and laterally. Punch biopsy of the mass was performed, and microscopy revealed heavy infiltration of abnormal plasmacytoid cells, some of which containing Dutcher bodies, which are typically seen in these abnormal plasma cells. The positivity in CD138, MOM1, and Kappa light chains confirms the origin and monoclonality of these abnormal plasma cells. Furthermore, negative immunostaining for epithelial and lymphomatous tumors virtually rules out other similar abnormal cells of similar origin, with, which clinches the diagnosis of extramedullary plasma cytoma. A skeletal survey was done as workup to establish solitary extramedullary plasma cytoma and to rule out multiple myeloma. No lytic bone lesions were detected on skeletal survey. Follow-up pretreatment MRI with contrast six months after initial CT scan revealed an interval increase in the size of the previously noted heterogeneously enhancing T1, T2 weighted intermediate soft tissue mass centered in the left nasal vestibule. It exhibits restricted diffusion and areas of magnetic susceptibility artifacts with note of continual resultant mass effects as previously described in patients' initial CT scan. The patient underwent curative external beam radiotherapy of 50,000 milligray for a total of 25 fractions to the mass. She was well post radiotherapy with no further episodes of epistaxis or nasal obstruction. Post radiation therapy MRI and CT scan shows interval decreasing the size of the lobulated mildly enhancing mass within the left nasal vestibule five months following radiotherapy. There is still thinning and mild rightward deviation of the adjacent anterior nasal septum. However, CT scan now shows pairing of the adjacent left nasal bone and left nasal lacrimal duct by the mass within the left nasal vestibule. Solitary extramedullary plasmacytoma is a solitary soft tissue lesion comprising of abnormal neoplastic plasma cells between the spectrum of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance and multiple myeloma. It comprises of less than 1% of all malignant head and neck tumors and occurs in only 0.12 per 100,000 adult individuals. It has a male to female ratio of 3 is to 1 and lacks all the features of multiple myeloma. It is radiosensitive with less than 10% recurrence rate. However, 30 to 50% of patients can progress to multiple myeloma in a mean period of 1.5 to 2.5 years. In Philippine literature, this is the first reported case of extramedullary plasmacytoma in the nasal vestibule. In conclusion, solitary extramedullary plasmacytoma is a rare malignant localized tumor with good prognosis. It requires long-term follow-up with radiographic correlation in anticipation of local recurrence and progression to multiple myeloma. Radiologic imaging plays an important role in establishing non osseous involvement in subtype of plasma cytoma based on location, structural involvement, and temporal course of the tumor. These are my references. Thank you for your kind attention. The next case is by Dr. Andita Duyan Dinati, who will be presenting from Universitas Indonesia in Indonesia on pediatric intraosseous lesion. I am Andita Dihidayati, I'm a radiology resident from Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia. Today, I would like to present about pediatric cranial intraosseous lesion. It's not always meningioma. Be wary of malignancy. So as a background, neuroblastic tumors or, uh, consist of neuroblastomas, ganglioneuromas, and ganglioneuroblastomas. It is very common in childhood and common patients are the adrenal gland, retroperitoneal ganglia, or posterior mediastinum. 
can also be affected, but it is very rare. So glomerular neuroblastoma is intermediate risk tumor of the sympathetic nervous system with a propensity to metastasize. So it arises from neural crest sympathogonia, which contain element of both malignant neuroblastoma and benign glomerular neuroma. So this is a case about a 28-month-old boy having progressive increasing mass in the forehead two months before admissions. He also experienced bulging of the left eye and no neurological deficit. All neurological milestones are fulfilled according to the age and no history of trauma. He underwent brain MRI and diagnosed as meningioma by other hospital. A month later, he experienced seizures and brought to the ER. He underwent CT scan and it shows the trousers mass with sunburst periosteal reaction in the left frontal bone, suggestive malignant lesion from the frontal bone. The patient underwent surgical tumor removal and the histopathologic results after operations are ganglion neuroblastoma. So uh, in this image, it, it is an MR image from the previous hospital. A radiologist expertise was meningioma. Why? It has hypostosis and with a solid mass extraction. And if we can see here, it also have a dural tail. So it was assessed as a, as a meningioma before. Uh, however, as we can see in this uh, image also, if you look through all the sequences, it can appear as a mass with malignant characteristic from the left frontal bone. Why? It, uh, it becomes a malignant. If you can see from the SWI sequences, it shows a sunburst appearance of, of the uh, left frontal bone. After that, uh, from the CT scan, it also confirms the finding from the MR image previously. It has uh, it is an intraosseous lesion with uh, solid mass extraxial, and it has a solid sunburst appearance of periosteal reaction, which shows an a malignant lesion. So, as a discussion, meningioma is very uncommon in young patients. So, we have to think another cause uh, of these lesions. So uh, if you think about malignant tumor, you have to be very cautious when performing an MRI. Evolution through every sequence is also uh, necessary. SWI uh, gives best clue for interosseous lesions. So if you see the sunburst appearance, it shows aggressive interosseous lesions. Histopathology result uh, came out as a ganglion neuroblastoma. So what's next? Next question is, is it primary relations or metastasis? So uh, what's another modality that we should uh, apply to these patients? So abdominal MRI shows uh, suprarenal mass. So uh, the lesions on the frontal bone could be a metastasis. So a uh, lesson that we learned from these patients, epidemiology knowledge is very important to kinder from misdiagnosis. MRI is the best modality for pediatric patients. However, we need a good technique to reach a sufficient time and also uh, having a best sequence. Evolution truly every sequence gives clues for correct diagnosis. So I hope uh, from this case, we can learn more about um, malignant lesions so that it can help our patients in the future. These are the references that I used and thank you very much for listening. Our next case is by Dr. Ramon Aldo Reyes from Southern Philippines Medical Center, who will be presenting on cerebral schistosomiasis. Good day, everyone. I am Dr. Roman Reyes from Southern Philippines Medical Center. In behalf of my mentor, Dr. Antonio Cabrede, I would like to share with you the contrast enhanced cranial MRI findings in a Filipino male with cerebral cystosomiasis. Our patient is a 39-year-old Filipino male, Mary, who works as a farmer from a cystosomiasis endemic area in the Philippines. He had been complaining of mild, periodic, left-sided headache for six months before experiencing a sudden severe throbbing headache, localized still on the left side, 
but now associated with right-sided numbness and weakness and was shortly followed by episodes of generalized seizures. He did not have fever, weight loss, neck stiffness, visual or behavioral changes. It is interesting to note that it had hepatic schistosomiasis 21 years prior, which was treated and with subsequent yearly prophylaxis with prasiquantel. He was not known to have hypertension, diabetes, previous surgery, or history of significant head trauma. Family, sexual, and travel history were unremarkable. He was initially managed as a case of cerebrovascular accident with eventual consideration of an intraperineal tumor. Imaging were requested to aid in the diagnosis. On this non contrascranial CT scan, we see effacement of the ipsilateral suicide, Sylvian fissure, and lateral ventricle, as well as rightward displacement of the subpulsing midline structures, signifying a mass effect. We also see here these gaviform hypodense changes in the periventricular, deep, and subcortical white matter regions of the left temporal and parietal nodes. This vasogenic type of cerebral edema is not typically seen in stroke. Rather, this is highly associated with new plastic or infectious processes. Further investigation of post-contrast t one weighted images of the brain showed multiple clusters of intensely enhancing nodules at the left parietal and temporal lobes, with the largest conglomerate seen in the left parietal lobe. We also appreciate here variational gyriform edema characterized by these hypointense signals. This is much better appreciated in axial flare sequence. We see here abnormal variational hyperintense signal changes with well defined deep surface and finger like projections into the subcortical white matter. Rightward shift of the midline structure is likewise appreciated. Now, these findings of intensely enhancing nodules in clusters, plasogenic edema, and midline shift were in accordance with earlier studies on cerebral schistosomiasis. You et al. reported similar findings in a 47 year old woman diagnosed with cerebral schistosomiasis, showing multiple intensely enhancing small nodules, that is 1 to 3 millimeter in diameter, clustered closely together, perilational edema, and mid leg shift on post contrast T1 mated image. The patient similarly presented with recurrent headaches prior to the seizure. The enhancing nodules seen are probably granuloma formation surrounding the schistosome head. These discrete nodular and linear enhancing nodules are not described in other CNS worm infections, tuberculoma, or neoplastic disease processes, and are therefore considered highly characteristic of cerebral schistosomiasis. Similarly, a local study by Rocha and Biocchino in 2015 reported nodular enhancing lesions and vasogenic edema in a 35-year-old male with cerebral schistosomiasis who likewise presented with generalized seizures. Our patient's abdominal ultrasound is consistent with previous schistosomiasis infection. Rectal biopsy and rectal imprint later revealed schistosoma ova. The addition of prasiquantel led to significant clinical improvement with no recurrence of seizures or other unusualities. In this report, we highlighted the combination of clinical signs, exposure history, serological tests, and imaging tool is needed to make a conclusive diagnosis of cerebral schistosomiasis. And more importantly, the distinctive pattern of clustered nodular enhancement and perilational edema are useful for the non invasive diagnosis and potentially help avoid unnecessary surgery. That ends my report. Thank you very much. The next presentation is by Dr. Sanket Dash from the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in India, who will be presenting on tuberculosis masquerading as a neoplasm. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Sanket Das, Senior Resident from the Division of Neuroimaging and International Neurobiology from the Department of Radio Diagnosis and Imaging from Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, which is a tertiary care institute and an institute of national importance in the northern Indian city of Chandigarh. I will be presenting a case report of tribal tubercular osteomyelitis masquerading as Calvis neoplasm in a young child. So this was an eight-year-old male child who presented to us with history of high grade fever, headache, non-projectile vomiting, neck pain, and later developed central diabetes receptors 
during the course of hospital admission. On examination, cervical lymphadenopathy was present. There was neck rigidity and Kernick sign and Brzezinski signs were positive. There were no other focal neurological deficits. In the laboratory investigations, the hemogram was within normal limits and the CSF examination was inconclusive. So this is the axial CT in the bone window reconstruction and the axial post contrast T1 MR imaging and the sagittal post contrast T1 MR imaging, which shows permeative lytic destruction in the petrochlival region and adjacent body and weak subsplenoid bone, basi occiput, occipital condyles with enhancing soft tissue extending into the cella supracellar region, extending along the infundibular and along the prepontine and the premedullary system, along the neura and the tectorial membrane up to the C2 vertebra inferiorly. There is also involvement of the posterior red model and the spinoidal air cells. This is the T1 post contrast axial MR imaging and the T2 weighted axial MR imaging with the flare images of the same child shows presence of small ring enhancing region in the left occipital lobe. Additionally, we can see that there is central T2 hypo intensity within this region with adjacent pair lesion retina. Other important findings being presence of epidermal thickening and enhancement along the left lateral ventricle. There is also adjacent leptomeningeal enhancement along the superior cerebellar folia, along the tectum, and along the left half of midbrain. Other important finding being presence of cervical FDG PET CT in the same child shows the presence of FDG AVED soft tissue lesion in the petrochlival region, along with presence of FDG AVED cervical lymph nodes. There is also additionally another FDG AVED lesion in the right half of acetabular. So, based on these findings, the differentials were broadly divided into two groups the neoplastic group and the infective group. In the neoplastic group, the possibilities could be rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, small brown blue cell tumor, or adenine sarcoma, and histocytic tumor such as LCH. Whereas in the infective group, the possibilities considered were invasive fungal infection and granulomatous infections like tuberculosis. So, to confirm the diagnosis in nasal endoscopy and endoscopic spinoid sinus biopsy was performed. This is the HND stain microscopy in 10x and 40x power, which shows presence of cases necrosis, epithelioid cells, and presence of lung and type of giant cells. This confirms tubercular etiology of the lesion. So, the final diagnosis made was petroclivus spinodal tubercular osteomyelitis with P2 tree environment, leptomeningeal spread, tuberculomas, and the tubercular cervical lymphadenopathy. And the child was thus started on anti tubercular therapy. So, this is the post contrast MR imaging that was done two months post starting of anti tubercular therapy. So, this shows significant reduction in the mass like soft tissue in the clival region. Additionally, there is presence of this multiple conglomerated ring enhancing lesions in the basal systems, which gradually decreased with the continuation of the anti tubercular therapy. So, primary tuberculosis of petroclival bones is a rare entity and its uh, incidence is only 0.01%. And the probable explanation is the rarity of lymphatics in this region. Literature review of such cases shows presence of variable imaging patterns with or without involvement of spinoid sinus, nasopharynx, and associated meningitis. The diagnosis is always confirmed by biopsy and it shows a very good response to antitubercular therapy. The diagnosis is often challenging because of the incidence onset, low bacterial load in this location and difficulty in sampling. And imaging is thus often the first clue for early diagnosis and it requires a very high index of suspicion by the radiologist, particularly in endemic areas because early diagnosis and treatment results in excellent clinical outcomes. So to take, take home message is permeative bony destruction with soft tissue component either in the long bones or in the skull base. A granulomatous infection should be kept in the differences, especially in endemic regions, in order to avoid misdiagnosis and start early treatment. So these were my references. Thank you very much. Hello. Okay, so our last case is by Dr. Elmer Tagra from the Medical City in Philippines, who will be presenting on GM1 gangliosidosis. Good day to you all. I am Dr. Tiger from the Medical City, Philippines. Today, I will present a rare cause of global developmental delay. First of all, I have no disclosures. Our patient is a one-year, three-month-old male proband who presented with a chief complaint of increased sleeping time and poor appetite. He is the third child of non-consanguineous parents of mixed Filipino and Chinese descent. Born to a 33-year-old G3P1-1011 mother with a history of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome with otherwise unremarkable prenatal and birth history. 
The patient had normal growth and development until the seven months of age when the mother noted that the patient was unable to gain weight with loss of the ability to hold objects, roll over, and respond to name calling. On physical exam, patient was noted to be abundant. Developmental age was assessed to be of a three-month-old infant, suggesting global developmental delay. Other findings include micrognathia, pectus excavatum, hand tremors, and pes cavus. Fasting blood sugar reveal hyperglycemia. CBC shows anemia. Thyroid function tests suggest central hypothyroidism, while your liver function test shows elevated liver enzymes, bilirubin panel, and bleeding parameters. On plain cranial CT scan at the level of the basal ganglia, we noted hyperdense thalamine. There is also widened sulci inappropriate for age, suggesting cortical atrophy. Follow-up cranial MRI was done in this coronal T2 image at the level of the thalamus. We noted diffuse white matter hyperintensities extending from the deep to subcortical white matter. Also, there is symmetric T1 hyperintense, T2 hyperintense signals of the thalamus. There was better delineation in the extent of the cerebral atrophy with prominence of the fourth ventricle. Single voxel spectroscopy was done with the ROI placed at the T1 hyperintense thalamus or intermediate TE. We detected a lipid lactate and acetate peak, increased choline peak, and decreased N acetyl aspartate peak. The constellation of neuroimaging findings are suggestive of a neurometabolic disorder. On the first hospital day, the patient was admitted at the pediatric ICU. Aciclovir and broad spectrum antibiotics were started to treat infection. Patient was abundant and anemic. Chest x ray reveals mild pneumonia. During stay in the ICU, the patient exhibits persi persistently decreased sensorium and patient developed desaturation episodes secondary to progressing pneumonia, eventually requiring MECVEN support on the 12th day. During his 10th hospital day, 2 d echo was done which revealed decreased right ventricular function with tricuspid regurgitation causing pulmonary congestion and hypotension. The patient also developed purpura on the left foot on the 10th day which progressed in extent and eventually developed necrosis. On the 21st hospital day, the patient had clinical signs of respiratory failure, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and cardiac failure, which together led to the patient's demise. Prior to the patient's demise, the parents gave consent to proceed with genetic testing. However, the patient was undergoing blood transfusion. Hence, the mother opted for genetic screening, which revealed that she is a carrier for a pathogenic GLD-1 variant caused by a substitution and mistransmutation of the GLD-1 gene causing replacement of histidine with aspartic acid at codon 102 of the GLD-1 protein. Subsequently, targeted genetic analysis of the patient using dry blood spots revealed an inframe deletion in exon 3 causing loss of the serine at position 95. Another GLD-1 variant was also detected, which is the similar variant found in the mother. Based on the findings, the diagnosis of GM1 gangliosidosis was made. For my take-home points, infantile GM1 gangliosidosis is an extremely rare pan-ethnic inborn error of metabolism with a prevalence of 1 in 100,000 to 200,000. It is a lysosomal storage disorder caused by a deficiency of the enzyme beta-galactosidase, which has a ubiquitous role in cellular signaling, explaining its multi-organ presentation. Clinically, it may present with psychomotor regression with a fulminant clinical course with no effective treatment available. Neuroimaging is key in establishing the diagnosis, and the most common finding is cortical atrophy. On CT, we may also see bilateral hyperdense thalami, while on MRI, it may present with demyelinating disease and abnormal signals in the thalamus and basal ganglia. Here's a T1 image showing the hyperintense signals of the basal ganglia and thalami. MR spectroscopy will show decreased n acetyl aspartate and increased choline. However, the imaging findings are nonspecific and may overlap with other metabolic disease. Hence, a holistic and multimodality approach is key in the diagnosis. Here are my references. And maraming salamat po. Thank you all for listening. Good day to you. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in so far, we're going to take a brief intermission. During this time, the judges are going to review the cases that were presented and vote on the best cases. Um, during the intermission, we'll also be giving the opportunity for you as the audience to be voting on your favorite case. So you'll be presented with two different polls. 
um, each of which will ask you to choose your favorite case and we'll be presenting the winners shortly after the break. We'll look forward to seeing you back here in about five minutes. All right. Um, I don't see anyone else. Let's see. Intermission. Oh, the intermission sign is off. All right. So that means that we are up, ready to do this. Um, that was a lot of discussion. Thank you, everybody that is uh, has chosen to hang out with us till the very end. Um, <clears throat> We, it, it took a little bit longer than we anticipated because there were a, a lot of cases that we would like to, to mention and we wanted to talk about it, make sure that, um, uh, you know, that only the, the best cases got, got, the, got the prices, but also acknowledging that it's really hard to, um, to decide when all the cases are of good quality. So, <clears throat> uh, how are we going to do this, Farouk? Am I announcing? You are announcing. No, you are muted. I, don't, I cannot hear you. I think you're announcing, Hansel. I think you're, as our senior colleague, I think you do Can not. one person say all three? That's as, what I heard. That's the oldest person in this panel. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now I can hear you. No. Please go ahead, Hansel. Do the honor. The people are waiting. The people want to know. I know people are waiting. No, but before we start the same names, thank you again to Dr. Yao for hanging out with us and helping us like with all the fast typing and all the numbers for each presentation. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope that you have fun. Um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, so this is what we have for um we're going to go in reverse order, right? So for the third place, and I, I need an agenda so I can read this simultaneously. For the third place, we have Dr. Nona Shrestha uh, from Thailand, uh, presented to us a case of eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. Great case, great images, congratulations. For um, the second place, we have, uh, where are you? Dr. Justin Daniel Belmonte from the Philippines presenting on the nomotratic cyst. Again, great case, great images, and a great presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you very much and congratulations. And the overall winner, um, Right, and remember that the first place gets a $1,000 um, cash prize that um, we'll contact you by email later to for the details. But the winner of this round of the competition is uh, Dr. Roman Aldo Reyes from the Philippines with uh, a case of cerebral uh, chistosomiasis contrast enhanced MRI. Uh, those are our winners. And then our people's choice, right? Oh, people's choice. Did they vote it? People have spoken, yes. People have spoken. All right, so for the People's Choice Award, remember this award was voted on from the poll. Uh, we have nothing to do with this one, but we are happy that it went to Dr. Nico Lug uh, Lugin de la Cruz from the Philippines, uh, presenting a case of vein of Galen malformation and the um, endovascular treatment of it. So congratulations. Uh, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you guys for hanging out with us and congratulations to the winners. We do have uh, one last favor to ask for all of those that stay uh, till now and is to please fill up the evaluation form and uh, let us know how we did and anything that we should do better. So, um, here are the winners, and unfortunately, the next slide is the evaluation. <laughs> so we will be toggling between those two. 
Um, but um, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam, for presenting. Thank you, Alejo, for uh, helping us. See you next year. Yeah. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>